Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Oftentimes, when people hear a study in the book of Revelation, they get excited. They are very intrigued by mystery. They want to know what's the significance of that number that we talked about last week, 666. Who does that point to? And there's all sorts of things, this mysteries that people want to know. But let me tell you something. When we study the book of Revelation, what's important to God is how we live. That those who have received the blood of Messiah, that we live in a way that reflects our redemption. And understand, we've seen that there's a relationship between the blood of Messiah and a proper, a godly testimony, a testimony that reflects the character of Yeshua. And what did Yeshua never do? He never sinned. Let me put that a different way. He never violated the commandments of God. So what are we supposed to glean from that? Those who are redeemed, who receive the grace of God through the blood of Messiah, those people are called to live in such a way that reflects the character of Yeshua. And it's these things that we should be the utmost concerned about, how we live and behave in this world. Are we living in a way that is worshipful? Are we behaving in a way that's praiseworthy to God? So in Revelation chapter 13, we ended with the fact that, that there's going to be the ability in the future to utilize the wisdom of God and understand the significance of that number 666. But let me share with you, although I've heard many different interpretations of it, some say it's even air, uh, air, Arabic, that's a ridiculous thing. But, but what I need to share with you, until this time is at hand, we're not going to be able to discern that. So many things, and remember how Daniel plays such an important role in this book. And Daniel was given things that required wisdom. He was told to seal them up until the last days. So many of these mysteries, we need to be concerned with what? We need to be concerned with understanding what God says about them. So when the things begin to manifest themselves, we'll be able to discern the truth and be able to solve these mysteries and produce the obedience that God has called us to. Well, let's move now into Revelation and chapter 14. Now, this is a very important chapter because it speaks about something that we've already encountered. And what is that? that 144,000 that were sealed with the mark of God, the seal of God, upon their foreheads. And what do we learn about that? Well, each of those 144,000, it was 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were called in a general sense, the servants of God. And what we need to see is this, in the book of Revelation, we're going to see numerous examples of where there's going to be a coming together intimacy between Moses and Messiah. We're going to find that people are going to sing a new song. And that song is going to be the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And because of where these scriptures are found that speak about the song of the Lamb and the song of Moses, I believe that is a great hermeneutical assistance. That is, it helps us understand and interpret things so that we can have a right understanding of that number, 144,000. Let me tell you, many things in, in the book of Revelation speak to things in a general sense. We've talked about how the number 12, what does it refer to? Well, it refers both to the 12 tribes and the 12 disciples. I think that's very significant. 
We also know that number thousand speaks about completion or that in its entirety. So many scholars, they understand this number 144,000 to speak about the, the children, the people of God. And I believe that's exactly what we glean when we look at Revelation 14. We see back in Revelation chapter 7 that it speaks about Israel, those who are going to be preserved for the kingdom, those who have that relationship with, with Moses, and we're going to see something unique about this group of 144,000. So this number is being used in two different places in order to teach a very important truth. What is that? Well, look with me. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. John says, I looked and behold a lamb. Now, here again, we've talked over and over. This word for lamb has to do with the Passover lamb. Passover has to do with redemption. So the first thing we need to understand when we look at Revelation 14 is the context is redemption. The lamb is present. And notice what else we read. I looked and behold a lamb standing on the Mount of Zion. Now, earlier we see in Revelation chapter 7 that, that the people were sealed, but it says nothing about the lamb, says nothing about Messiah, and it says nothing about Mount Zion. Now, why do you think Mount Zion is mentioned? Here again, we need to have a proper understanding of language. God uses terms in order to convey to us spiritual truth. The term Zion, that word comes from a Hebrew. It's Hebrew in, in origin, and it means to mark, like to mark a location. But that same word Zion, it can be, be altered and become the word Mitsuyan. And what is Mitsuyan? It's the Hebrew word for that which is excellent. So what I want you to see is this. In a very real way, what God is saying is this. Redemption leads to excellency. And it's through the Lamb, the Redeemer, that we can find ourselves together with Messiah and living with Him in excellency. That means in the fulfillment of the purposes and plans of God. What we're going to see here is this 144,000, they reflected the purposes, the plans, the excellency of God. Once more, I looked and behold a lamb standing upon the Mount of Zion, and with him were 144,000. Now, we saw this, Revelation 7, referring to the people of God and also to the people of God in the sense of Israel, those 12 tribes. Well, remember, Israel is made up of two components. There are those who are going to be brought into the kingdom by faith, but in the last days. They, and I'm talking about uh, unbelieving Israel, one of the reasons that we're going to see what we're going to discover in Revelation chapter 16 and 17 is that we're going to see that God is going to allow the toughest, the most difficult, the hardest time for the Jewish people. Why? This tribulation is going to bring them to dependence upon God and prepare them to act in faith. What do I mean by that? Sometimes faith comes out of desperation. That's what God taught the children of Israel in the wilderness. And this is going to be the same thing here. That's who we're referring to in, in Revelation chapter 7. Those who are going to be brought into the wilderness in order that they might come to faith out of desperation because of the time of Jacob's trouble. But now what we're looking for are those who are demonstrating the excellence of God, those who are standing with Messiah. And what does it say about this group of 144,000? Well, notice very carefully. It says... They had the name, some say his name, referring to Messiah's name. There's other translations that say the name of his father, written where? Upon their foreheads. So this mark, this seal that was on their forehead, it all has to do with who? It all has to do with God, their commitment, their covenantal relationship with God. Notice what we read in verse, verse 2. And I heard a voice from the heavens the voice of many, much water. 
Now, water rushing in the book of Revelation, it represents the people of God and it represents them worshiping or them praising God. So what we find here is that there's a connection. How is the scripture being revealed to us? This group of 144,000 who are connected to, to Messiah Yeshua, these individuals are also connected to what? Worship. And they're heavenly connected as well. So all these things go together. We've seen over and over, redemption leads to worship. We have been redeemed to worship God. So once again, verse 2. I heard a voice from the heavens, the voice of, of much water, the voice of a great thunder, and I heard a sound, the sound of those who were, were, were playing on harps, holding harps and playing them, playing their harps. And look at verse 13. What did they do? They sung a new song. Now, what we find is this. Understand what the scripture is trying to say. The context here is worship. They have their harps, they're worshiping. And what are they doing? They're singing a new song. It is through redemption that we're able to worship God in a new way. Remember what Messiah says. He says there's coming the time and it's at hand when God is going to recall, require people to worship him. How? In spirit and truth. That is through Messiah. Understand as well, there's a relationship between this term new and the kingdom. When we get into later on into the last section of Revelation chapter 21 and 22, when we're dealing with the new Jerusalem, when it talks about that final state of the kingdom, it's going to say, behold, all things are new. There's a relationship between the word new and kingdom. So when it says they sung a new song, what we can rightly dis discern from that is that they were singing a kingdom song a song that only redemption will bring about in a person's life. So once more, they were holding these harps, verse 3, and they sung a new song before what? Before the throne. Now, what does that speak of? It speaks of submissiveness. They came before God, His presence, how? Submissiveness. They acknowledge His rule. So let's just pause for a moment. You know, Part of the purpose of this book of Revelation is to teach us how to live, not just in the last days, but even today. And what God wants us to do is to live in such a way that we demonstrate our obedience to Him, that people can see that we are an individual under authority. I remember what took place in a town called Capernaum or Capernaum, and there there was a Roman soldier a ruler over a thousand soldiers. And this man impressed Yeshua. He was a faithful man. Why? Because he understood authority. So if you want to be faithful, if you want to live in a way that represents the, the kingdom truth, you have to learn to submit to authority. That is, obedience needs to be a characteristic for you. So it says they sung that new song before the throne and before the four uh, uh, creatures and before the elders and there was no one that was able to learn this song except who? The 144,000 and what was unique about them? Why could these 144,000 who represents the people of God, why could they be the ones, the only ones to learn this song? Notice what it says, is because they were what? Because they were redeemed from the earth. That means in this age. They acted in this age into God's call of salvation. They responded. They experienced redemption. And here again, even though this book of Revelation, like all the New Testament, was written in the Greek language. You know, I'm amazed. A lot of people want to say that they believe the book of Revelation and other books in the New Testament were written first in Hebrew. But, but that's not even logical for a couple different reasons. One of which is this. The purpose of these books were to, to have them sent among where? <laughs> among the world. To, to those communities that were communities of faith. Understand, by the time most of these books were, were written, what do we know? We know that a good portion of these books were written after the destruction of the temple, meaning people were already in exile. And what was the language of the world at that time? It was Greek. 
So it only makes sense, but understand as well, many of the principles are Hebrew from their mindset, from the culture. And there's a play on words here in the Hebrew language. Why do I say that? Well, it talks about them being redeemed, but look at verse 4. It says, these are the ones who have not uh, been defiled with, with women. Now, this word defile in the Hebrew language, the same word for redemption, it's, it's augmented, but it's also the same word for defilement. And what it shows us is how close truth is. I mean, you can just turn a little bit one way or the other. One leads to redemption, one leads to defilement. That's what he's saying. It is very important that we get it right. And what's the defilement? Well, here we need to have a mindset that comes from Judaism, from a proper understanding of the prophets. Why do I say that? There's people who want to look at this and say, oh, this speaks to literally 144,000 virgin men. But when we look at the prophets, and remember, the book of Revelation, John borrows and borrows and borrows from prophecy. And when we look prophetically, when it speaks about uh, uh, defilement from women, what's it speaking about? It's speaking about what is called in Hebrew, avodah zarah, which is idolatry. When it speaks about uh, uh, adultery, and we'll come to that again in the book of Revelation later on in chapter 17. It's not simply speaking about physical, sexual adultery. It's talking about idolatry. That's the prophetic uh, terminology, the symbol, symbolic language. So these individuals, because of redemption, they worship rightly. They don't fall into an idolatrous lifestyle. Look, if you would, to verse 4. It says, these are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they are virgins. That is, that they are, are right. They are faithful to God. These are the ones, and it talks about what being a virgin is, those who go after the lamb wherever he goes. For these are the ones who were redeemed from the midst of man. They are the first fruits to God and the lamb. Notice the connection. First fruits has to do with resurrection. So it's talking about these first fruits. They had a resurrected experience. What does that mean? They identified with the lamb who was slain. When he died, we died. When he rose from the dead, we rose. So that's what it's trying to tell us here, that this has to do with the body of believers. Look on. It says here in verse, verse 6 or verse 5, we read, They were the ones who were redeemed from the midst of man, the firstborn, the first fruits to God and the lamb. Verse 5. And there was no deceit found in their mouth, for they are pure before, what does it say? The throne of God. Here again, throne. They are ones who submit to the authority of God. So here, Revelation chapter 7, talking about an Old Testament people that will come into the kingdom. They are being preserved. They are sealed for salvation. Here in Revelation chapter 14, it's speaking about those, a New Testament people who have faith in the Lamb, who have been redeemed, who submit to the authority of God's rule. What does it say? They submit before the throne of God. Look, if you would, to verse 6. Now, verse 6 is very important because why does that appear at this location? What does verse 6 say? Let's read it. I looked and there was another angel and he was flying in the midst of the heavens and it was given to him, this is an assignment, that he might proclaim the everlasting gospel to those who dwell upon the earth, to every nation, to every family, every language and every people. Now, here's the important thing. We need to allow scripture to interpret scripture. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about. Turn for a moment to the book of Matthew and chapter 24. I've alluded to that several times. This is where Messiah is talking about the last days. Messiah chapter, or Matthew chapter 24, we find that Yeshua is coming out of the temple. The disciples begin to speak. They find themselves on the Mount of Olives, a very important prophetic location having to do with the return of Messiah. And they begin to ask him questions about uh, uh, restoring the kingdom to Israel. They begin to ask him things about the last days and the sign of his return and all of these things. 
And, and he talks about saying, beginning in Matthew 24 and verse 6, that there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be wars, there's going to be famines, there's going to be all types of, of things which bring about instability and chaos in the world. In the midst of this, there's going to be a new government authority that rises. And the first thing that he's going to do, this government, is that he is going to persecute believers, those who have the word of the Messiah and his testimony. Now, let me tell you where we're going in this world. You know, when you watch the news today, what you hear is extremism, those who are radical, those who take things literally. Now, let me tell you, there is a problem with those who take falsehood literally or symbolically. Symbolically, it doesn't matter. But there's a movement to say these people who are extreme in their religion, they're bad news. Well, when you're following a false religion, it's bad news. But that's all setting the stage to say to you and me who follow in a committed, in a literal way, the Scripture, that we're going to be viewed as extremists and we're going to be persecuted. And there's going to be a time that we talked about. Remember what our study was in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7? How we're going to be overcome? That's okay, in the flesh. But we're going to be triumphant in the spirit, in the new body, and in this time of the establishment of the kingdom of God. So all of this is being prepared. And what I want you to see here is Yeshua, after he talks about this time of persecution of believers that begin and it comes out of instability in, in, in Matthew 24, verse 9, let's look at what it says. We read here, and then they're going to deliver you over to, to, to torture and they will put you to death and you will be hated by all the nations on account of my name. And so he talks about this persecution. And then notice what he says. If you endure, if you have perseverance, and that's what he says in verse 13. He says, and the one who waits and endures to the end, this one he will be what? Saved. Look at verse 14. After this time of persecution, what happens? Verse 14 says, and then the gospel of this kingdom will be proclaimed to all the world as a testimony to all the nations. And then after that, the end will come. What end are they talking about? The end of what we can say, the church age. Why? Because the next thing we see here is the abomination of desolation. Immediately after the abomination of desolation. Now, we don't know if it's an hour, a day, a week, a few months, whatever. But soon after the abomination of desolation, that's when the end of the church age is going to be, according to what we've learned and talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And what happens after that? Well, immediately after the abomination of desolation, then we see after the rapture, the enemy is going to set his attention to who? To the children of Israel. And that's what's going to begin that time of Jacob's trouble that we have referred to over and over. So it's very significant that after speaking about a time of persecution of believers, what's going to happen? The gospel is going to be proclaimed to all the world. What do we see here? Immediately after talking about those who are standing with Messiah, those who are faithful, who did not love their lives to death, those who did not fall into idolatry but worship God properly and submitted to his judgment, who demonstrated obedience. These individuals, it says, at the end, what's going to happen? At the end of that time, just like it says in Matthew 24, he says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of the heavens, and to him it was given, this assignment, that he might proclaim the everlasting gospel to those who dwell upon the earth. And in this sense, we're talking about all humanity. Why? Because it says to every nation, to every family, every language, and every people. Verse 7. And, and a great verse spoke, Fear God and bring glory to Him, for the time of His judgment has come. Now, this is important. Why? Because right now we see something. After the rapture in verse chapter 14, talks about a raptured people. It talks about those who have come out of this time of persecution. So what do we find here? Well, we find in, in verse 7, 
a great voice announcing the judgment of God coming. And the judgment and the wrath of God comes after the rapture. Why do I say that? Because we've learned from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9 that we have not been appointed for wrath, but to obtain salvation. And here the term salvation means the outcome of salvation, meaning entrance into the kingdom of God. That's what we've been appointed to. We won't be here when the wrath of God begins to fall. Let's conclude. We see here that the judgments are coming, and it says, Worship the one who made heaven and earth and the sea, and what? The springs of water. Now, why does this passage end with the springs of water? Because it's talking about water and the source of water. Water in the scripture is synonymous with life. So it says, worship God, fear God, who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and these springs of water. Why? Because to tell us that he is the source of life. And what I want to conclude with this message is simply this. Have you accepted the source of life, Messiah Yeshua, into your heart? Have you responded to that gospel? that says Messiah entered into this world and he laid down his life upon a tree and he died, was buried, but on the third day he rose again. This resurrection signifies victory and hope in what? In the kingdom that he's going to establish when he comes back. So it mentions these springs of water as a source of life. Worship the one, the only one who can give you life. There's no other source. There's no other means that you can turn to to find eternal life. Well, we'll close with this until next week when we press on in Revelation chapter 14. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.